salute. Let's not go over a smart salute. Let's not go over salute. Berkowitz. There are other Indiana. places I could think of. Actually. As could you. You're watching Public Affairs. Berkowitz is my name, and politics is our game, and we will be doing lots of politics and public policy because our guest this evening is State Representative David Harris, who has a world of knowledge. I mean, this guy was in the military, active, and reserves for 33 years. He is a two-star general, retired. Is that right? Correct. He was the Illinois Adjutant General. That meant he commanded 13,000 Illinois National Guard troops. He was a state rep from, get this right, 83 to 92, thereabouts. Yeah. And then, um, then he ran, well, he was a vice president, senior vice president, Illinois Hospital Association. And last but not least, he came back two years ago and was reelected as state rep in Arlington Heights, from Arlington Heights. Correct. Yeah. And uh, you know now, now he's being a bit of a <coughs> gadfly, somebody might say, or a maverick. It turns out he's got this John McCain in him because you know you're you're sidling up with the enemy. <coughs> that is the uh, that is the folks on the other side of the aisle, Democrats. You have formed a coalition, as I understand it, for pension reform. Are there are 20 sponsors of this bill. 21. How many of them are Democrats? Uh, 18 or 19. And there will be two Republicans. You two and or three. Who are the other Republicans? Specifically, I know Chris, Representative Chris Nybo uh, from Elmhurst is on the bill. Okay. And anybody else? That's it? Uh, none that have officially signed on, although others have stood in support. But you know, because there, there aren't many Republicans. It's, an, it's almost an extinct species here in <laughs> Illinois. In the State House, you know, they, it, was, it was before the last election on November 6th. The margin in the State House was 64 to 54. So the Republicans were running around saying six and six, something like that, you know, six and we got the majority or something. And then things looked a little tougher, so they said, okay, we might just pick up three or four net gain. Then they said net gain two or three, and then the election, and they lost seven. So the question to you, State Representative David Harris, is why should anybody pay attention to anything the Republicans say? Because you were so off, not you personally, but Republicans as to what you could do in terms of gaining the majority or at least gaining seats. And number two, now that the margin is is 71-47 and you need 13 votes, if you were to try to initiate legislation, you would have to have all the Republicans and you'd have to get 13 Democrats to switch. And we know that ain't gonna happen. So, I, I mean, somebody might say, why did I invite you here? Yeah. And, the, and the, my answer is you're one of the smartest, most, most thoughtful, most principled people. But what kind of impact could you have with those smarts, with those principles? Your question was, uh, why should anybody listen to us? Yes, why we should can, they listen we can to us? We can initiate legislation. Anybody, any legislator no, can initiate legislation. Can we pass legislation? Can't even get it, you can't even get it brought up. Isn't Speaker Mike Madigan? Oh, I think, comes I, think, up? I think some of the legislation you, will get brought up. Give cross but the, a reason that, the reason people should listen to us is because, quite frankly, I think we have better ideas on the issues than the, uh, the opposing party. Unfortunately, we are not in the majority, so some of our ideas may not see the light of day. So the most important thing, we were just talking about this before the show, and that's how I get prepped, because I bring Representative Harris over, and I don't know squat, but he knows a lot, and so he tells me, I cheat a little bit, folks, so that's my prep, is what David Harris has to say. And in a conversation with David, I realized, okay, you can't get a majority for another decade, for sure. I mean, it's the maps against you, it's 71-47, but in two years <coughs> as an election for governor, and you could win, possibly. At least that's much more attainable to win the governor's race in 2014 than to get the majority. And if you do that, then you have a governor who can put a break on the legislation coming out of the state house and state senate because the governor can veto it. Is that right? That's correct. I, you know, look, I didn't go to school just to eat my lunch. I learned a little civics, right? Veto. That's veto. the main thing. That's right. Okay. No, so, we, we, so just let me interrupt to say, what is the message as of we're taping this on December 9th, December 9th, the year 2012? And what is the message that's coming out of the Republican Party as of today for the governor's race in November of 2014? Well, you, gotta, you might modify it a little bit, but if somebody said to you, just hypothetically, you know, we're really thinking ahead, two years later, two years later there's going to be a race for governor. People are already, we'll be talking about that in the show, 10 or so people, depending on how you count them, running for governor. So it's not premature to say to you, David Harris, what is the message of the Republican Party about why people should vote for a Republican for governor in 2014? Right. And first of all, let's ask the question, why did we do so badly? Why we, the Republican Party, why did we do so badly in, uh, in the most recent elections? I will say that it comes down to three uh, 
M's, the map, the money, and the message. So we probably, we definitely were working against a map that was drawn by the Democrats. The Democrats had gobs of money and maybe we didn't do the message properly. But let's look at the governor's race. And the governor's race, I think, offers a real opportunity. And Illinois, and I may be the only person who believes this, but Illinois is, is a Democrat-controlled state, but that doesn't mean it's a Democrat state. If you go back and look in history, Thompson versus, uh, versus Stevenson in 82, fast forward to Hartigan and Edgar, fast forward to uh, Governor Ryan and Pichard, just look back to, to uh, two years ago, uh, uh, Quinn and Brady. There were six million votes cast in that election, and the Republicans only lost by 30,000. And all those other elections that I mentioned to you, the, the split was 50-50, was 51, 49, 51 and a half, 48 and a half. My point is, well, now it is, my point is on a okay. statewide basis, the Republicans can win. We elected Mark Kirk, we elected Dan Rutherford, we elected um, Judy Bartopinka on a statewide basis. So when you get rid of these 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 Democrat-drawn legislative boundaries, this state is as, is as evenly <clears throat> divided as any other state. Well, we'll come to the message in a second, <clears throat> but let me just add to that, just because it's got to be fair. People say, you know, oh, Berkowitz, you're a Republican. Some people call me a closet Democrat. I'm neither. But if I have somebody, and technically you are on the right here, you need to be challenged usually from the left, and sometimes you just need to be challenged because that's what we're supposed to do. So when you throw out these margins of, you know, Number one, it is true, from 1976 to 2002, this state elected Republican governors, namely, as you point out, Thompson, Edgar, uh, and then and, and Governor George Ryan. Mm -hmm. And so that's 26 years. But you don't point out that the margin wasn't really that close with Blagojevich and Jim Ryan. I think it was like seven points. It wasn't one or two. Right. And then in, and then in 20, 2006, it was disgraceful. It was a disgrace. You had Rod Blagojevich beating Judy Bartopinka by, what, 50 to 40 and a third party getting 10%, I think, right. Right? right? That was a disgrace. You had a guy who was under investigation and soon to be indicted, or at least four years later he was indicted. No, two years later. And, and the best that you could do was 40%. And then, and then you, had, you have a state that is in awful shape. Almost everybody would have to agree, Democrats and Republicans in 2010, they were looking at the race in 2010 between Bill Brady and Pat Quinn, and Pat Quinn had been the governor for two years. And Pat, we're not biased, we're not against you. Come on the show, we'd love to have you. But people have to say, the state of Illinois was a disaster area. It is now, too. It was a disaster area. Everybody knew the pension mess. They knew the underfunding of 100 to $200 billion. They knew no, very little progress in education reform in Chicago as el elsewhere. They knew Medicaid was a mess. They knew virtually any measure of performance of the state government legislatively, which was controlled by the Democrats for a decade, the judiciary, which in a sense is controlled by the Democrats, especially lower level courts, but also the state Supreme Court, and the governor's chair. And yet what did they do? Oh, really good. You came really close. Bill Brady almost won. He just needed 16,000 people to switch their votes and vote for him instead of that. The point is, it shouldn't have even been close. It shouldn't have been close, right? Uh, I would like to say I, I, would like, I would like to say that it wasn't close. And yes, you can argue individual races. I mean, you can go back to '86 and no, and no, Tom, we're talking Tom, we're Thompson talking since 2002. Since but, the last decade is what. It, sure. The last decade, you guys haven't been close in the governor's race except in 2010. But by then, you had a decade of disaster. And how is it you couldn't you couldn't prepare a message? You couldn't assist Bill Brady as a party so he could win that race. How is it? Uh, we prepared a message, whether or not it was carried out as forcefully as it could have been carried out. Not only can you say, hey, this is how bad things are, but you also need to look ahead and say, this is how we can make things better. This is, and I, and I think, I'll go back to the presidential for a second. I think that's what Ronald Reagan did, both uh, when he ran the first time and ran the second time, and perhaps even uh, even uh, since then. Um, they look ahead and they say, "This is where we can take our state. This morning, is how we, morning this in America is, how, is that what it was? Sure, in '84. This is yeah. how we can make America better. This is how we can okay. make Illinois better." Here's an idea: Morning so, in Illinois. Yeah. So, so the sun the sun is coming up. I can see it now. I can see. 
I can get Pete Chan Greco to come out. He's a Democrat, you know, he does really, really good mail. Pete, would you come over and show the Republicans how to play this yeah. game? Okay. Oh, yeah. Because you, Pete would say, oh, morning in Illinois, the sun is rising, and ooh, who's going to be governor? They have like five or six potential candidates for governor. They have people finding they're invigorated because taxes are going down, not up. Pension reform is happening, so the pensions are viable systems. Medicaid, we have all sorts of alternatives for people. Morning in America. Tom Cross, want to come on the show and tell people about it? Chris Redonio, Republican leader in the Senate, Cross, Republican leader in the House, can't find him. You know, we, we air in Chicago, we air in Rockford, <laughs> we air in Aurora, we air in the 34 key Chicago metro suburbs, we air where David Harris lives. Would you invite Chris and Tom no, to come on and no, give me that I, answer? No, we were talking about the gubernatorial campaign and how we message a gubernatorial campaign, yeah, okay? okay? Uh, and, and We just messaged it for you. I think in two, well, I think in two years, those, those gubernatorial candidates will, will articulate their stands on issues. We'll see what the state, what the position of the state is at, at that time. I don't think it's going to be much better than it is right now. Uh, I still think we're going to be at the bottom of the barrel in terms of credit ratings and all those other things, and I think we can carry a very effective message Can't to the we people of the state of Illinois that we can make things better. I'm asking you, David Harris, what's the message as of today? Give me your best shot. The message of the Republican Party for governor in 2014 as of today, December 9th to 2012. Give me your I best shot. Illinois is at the bottom of the barrel in so many measurements. Uh, any way you want to look at it, we can make things better, and we can take this state okay. into a better better, brighter future. And, and the first half of that message was just tried and it lost. That is, Illinois is a terrible shape. Dan Proft has said, and I think he's right, you guys thought it was enough. He's not, I mean, he's a Republican, but he's not part of the establishment. The folks who are in the establishment thought it was enough to just say, Illinois is in terrible shape. They didn't articulate well enough as to how they would fix that. Am I right? Well, I'm not sure. sure. Did we, they try? Uh, I, I don't want to speak of the state as a whole. Each of these individual races, uh, remember, we did not no, have no. a statewide race this time. Each of these individual races, or, uh, both for the state Senate and the state House, uh, they ran their own campaigns. And I'm not sure we messaged that uh, Illinois is in such bad shape. We kept talking about the fact that taxes went up. I don't know that that grabbed people as much because they didn't feel it immediately. They're going to feel it now because of what's happened at the federal level. but. Uh, they didn't necessarily feel it immediately, so I'm not sure that had the impact that it, uh, that it was meant to have. So I don't know that we messaged well, properly, but well, you I'm say, not a genius. No, you're, but you're a smart guy. Don't be so modest. Okay? I told everybody you were a two-star general. I told everybody you had private sector experience. I told everybody you've been in the military for 33 years. You've done thousands of things, well, at least dozens, that I haven't done. So if, if I could articulate a, sort of a feeble message, you could do ten times better. And it really, David, you shouldn't be so modest, okay? I'm coming at this one more time. Prof says there's a brand to the Republican Party, right? What is the, now you can say each race is a little different. You lost a lot of these state rep races. You know, you only have 47 state reps left. You know, you're down a 13 point, 13 vote margin. You're down, you're down in the, in the Senate. What do you need? It's, a, it's, a, it's 40 to 19, <coughs> so you're down there, I guess, 11 votes. But yet, yet even though they're separate, there should be a brand across the state of Illinois when people think Republican. What does that brand represent to them? When they vote Republican, what do they get for it in terms of change? I don't mean personally, necessarily. Mm -hmm. you know, we're not uh, you know, doing this thing where we're sending out little packages to them. But do, what do they get in terms of an improvement in society's life in Illinois as a result of voting the Republican brand. It is my hope that the, the Republican gubernatorial candidate, whoever that is, is going to clearly state how he or she can make our state better and carry us into a better future, whatever issues they choose to articulate. Okay. Well, but could you take a stab at him today? You're on a task force. You know, you're in a coalition of Democrats and Republicans that we started the show talking about that has made some big news in the last week prior to December 9th because the leadership hasn't been coming up with any pension reform specifics, and you guys did. Now, would you like to tell those viewers, is that part of the new Republican brand, that legislation? How will it improve the pension process or the pension status for state employees? How will it improve the state employee pensions 
status in terms of how all taxpayers looked at that across the state of Illinois. How will Illinois be better off as a result of your proposed pension reform legislation? Well, well I, let, let's, before we talk about the, the pension bill that, uh, that, I, that I'm co-sponsoring, um, the issue is, quite frankly, the pension problem is sinking the state of Illinois. It's as simple as that. We will not be able to properly fund state government if we do not handle the pension issue. Okay. okay? We, all of us, all the legislators, were sent to Springfield to solve problems. This is a problem that has to be solved. So I don't have a problem reaching across and, and cooperating with my colleagues from the other side of the aisle. They don't have a problem cooperating with me. And I think that's what people want to see. Now, they may or may not like the bill that I'm co-sponsoring, but they want to see legislators saying, how do we address yeah. the most serious problem facing the state of Illinois? And tell our viewers, we're seeing that graphic, it says decrease the COLA, we see that on the screen, and remove compounding. Is that item one of your pension reform proposal for this group you're working with, 19 Democrats, two Republicans? You're going to freeze the cost of living adjustment, which right now means Pensions are going up every year, no matter what happens to the cost of living under the current legislation, 3% a year. You would freeze it under this legislation for five years, is that right? First of all, I don't call it a cost of living adjustment. Okay. If you want a cost of living adjustment, talk to a Social Security recipient who in 2013 is going to get a cost of living adjustment of 1.7%, who in 2010 and 2011 got a cost of living adjustment of zero. Yet in the state of Illinois, the annual automatic increase is 3% year in, year okay. out, compounded. It has nothing to do with what the cost of living is. So first of all, we don't totally freeze it. Uh, what the bill does is for the first $25,000 of retirement income, that stays the same. In other words, the automatic annual increase is applied to the first $25,000. Above $25,000, yes, there is a freeze for a period of time. For so, five years. For a minimum of five years, that's, that's correct. That's a, big that's a big chunk of time. Well, it's a big chunk of time. That is probably one of the biggest drivers of, of, of the pension problem right there. Right. But it, it protects, and that's why this bill, what I thought, was very creative in its approach. It creatively addresses the issue of how do you handle the individual who has worked for the state and has a modest retirement from the state, uh, and why do you penalize them? Well, we're not penalizing them because we're excluding uh, the retirements under 25000 it also addresses the issue of, of age, where they say uh, some of the previous bills have said we're just automatically going to raise the age to 67. Not the case here. In this bill, if you're 45 or older, there's no change in your retirement age. If you're between 40 and 45, there's a one-year increase. This is similar to what has happened in Social Security, where they've raised the, the retirement yeah, age by okay. one month. Along the same lines, a slight increase in the, uh, in the employee uh, in the employee contribution the first year, 1%. 1%. Exactly. And then after we that, also, how much? 2%. And, and that's then, it. And then, okay. that's right. And then we also, we also include in there what's known as a, uh, a uh, cash balance plan, which is a way of moving, a, a cash balance plan, and, and, and pensions get somewhat complicated, but a cash, cash balance plan is a defined benefit plan versus a defined contribution like a 401k but it's different from the defined benefit plan that we have now where the benefits are automatically locked in. It's based on your cash balance at the time of retirement. And it's also to establish a minimum <coughs> defined benefit. That's Not correct. Not actually an exact amount, That's but correct. a minimum defined benefit. But it, and it, it, you know, we, we, some of us watched uh, Ted Dabrowski, Ted Dabrowski is his name, at the vice president of the Illinois Policy Institute in a show aired this morning, December 9th on Fox Chicago Sunday speaking with Elaine Neckritz about this and you know Ted said as a matter of the from the Illinois Policy Institute he was this was nice they were doing something in terms of making a proposal you guys but he said you need to go more quickly to a 401k type plan you can't do this defined benefit thing he didn't say it but I would guess he might say it from having Ted's been on this show before John Tillman from the Illinois Policy Institute has been on the show. They're basically saying you cannot trust the politicians with these funds to do the right thing. If you go to a defined contribution plan, the individuals have the control over their pensions, at least some control. You, you don't disagree with that. You just say 
you're not going to get what the Illinois Policy Institute wants politically anytime soon. Am I right on that? I, I, I understand exactly where the Illinois Policy Institute is coming from. They'd like to see us do away with all these defined uh, benefit plans and move strictly to a defined contribution plan for all of the retirees or all of the, the employees of the state of Illinois. Politics is the art of the possible. Given the political situation in Illinois, what can we achieve? And I'm saying I, we're not going to move to a, a strictly 401 uh, type of plan. I don't think that is politically possible. Okay. And what, what we need to do is ensure that the plans that are in place are sustainable so that those folks who are retiring in the future will have the benefits that they deserve. I mean, the employees need the benefits that they deserve. And we cannot do, as I said earlier, we cannot properly fund the state of Illinois and fund all the pensions uh, at the same time. The main There's got to be some adjustments. Well, in addition to the criticism coming from the Illinois Policy Institute discussion we've just had, there's this other criticism that might come up that it hasn't been scored yet. You don't know right. how much of the $100 billion underfunding over the next 30 years right. would be cured by this. My suspicion is, and I think Ms. Representative Neckridge said today it's going to take 10 to 14 days. So like right around before Christmas, we'll find this out. Right. You folks will come back after the first. There'll be a bunch of lame ducks there. The cynics say, Speaker Mike Madigan and Senate President Colton are going to do whatever they damn well please. They're going to tell the, their members what to do, and they're going to march and do it. They're going to salute smartly, okay? I won't show you how to smooth, because I can't salute smartly. But these guys can, and this is going to all be, you're a part of, you don't realize this, you're all a part of a, a misdirection play, you know? You've got a role to play, and Speaker Mike's looking over this, and Cullerton's looking over this, and they're just using you. You guys are, I, I don't want to be too strong, but... <clears throat> you remember the phrase useful idiots? They used to refer to liberals. That's how the Stalinists referred to useful idiots in America. It's perhaps a little too, I don't think you're an idiot, but, but it's the same kind of idea <laughs> is that you're, you don't realize you're being used by the leadership to sort of distract you know, the public, and then they're going to come. You know how this works. You can have your own opinion as to whether or not we're being used. I can tell you that, that uh, what has been referred to as uh, leading from the trenches by the, uh, okay. by the Chicago Tribune, there are a group of, of here 21 legislators who are frustrated, totally frustrated by the lack of meaningful negotiations regarding the most serious problem facing the state of Illinois. There has not been a meaningful pension meeting in the past six months. And our unfunded liability continues to grow. The governor estimates it's anywhere between 12 and 15 million dollars a day. 96 billion dollars of unfunded liability, okay? How do we address that problem? How do we fund the pensions? We haven't met in the past, there's not been a meeting in the past six months. <clears throat> a total lack I, I of leadership. And I understand that. Total lack of leadership. I understand that and people are gonna, <clears throat> people are gonna applaud you for making the effort, I know that. And I may have been too strong in that language, I'm not saying that, I just know you'll get that criticism. But, you know, the, the, the President Cullerton we're, we're has, gonna, has already said he reacted coolly to the plan. Okay. Well, yeah, of course, we're clearly. trying to do something. Yeah, because he's going to say it's not constitutional, et cetera. We're going to continue to speak as the credits roll. There's the camera. You know, after, after 15 years, you'd think I could mm -hmm. find the camera. I criticize other people. Berkowitz, camera's right there. Okay, so we're going to continue to speak as the credits roll, but I very much want to thank our guest, State Representative David Harris. Thank you so much for You're coming You're welcome. Here. Good to be here. And we're going to, as you say, we're going to continue to talk because I, I mentioned that it's being scored. The governor is proposing a much more significant increase in employee contribution, a much more significant increase in the retirement age. I don't know on the freeze if he's proposing as much as you are in the COLA. I don't think this thing comes in if they score it right at more than 30 or 40 billion dollars at that. So you're still left with a major problem. Too little, too late. I disagree on two points. One, I think we'll it will see. score. I think it will score higher than that. And the second point I disagree on is the governor has not proposed anything. He's proposed general outlines. I'd like to see some. I just specific, outlined his legislation. I'd just That's like enough. to see some specific okay. legislation as to what he really would like to see. There has been an incredible lack of real, meaningful leadership coming out of the governor's office on this issue. It's nice to stand there and criticize the legislature and say they ought to they ought to fix the pension problem. What do you want to see done specifically? What do you want to see done? Draft some legislation and have a legislator introduce why, why it. Why do you think by, he doesn't do it? Because he doesn't want to take on the, because he doesn't, he doesn't want to take on the public sector unions? Uh, That's what this is about. It wouldn't, su it wouldn't about? surprise me at all. The public sector unions, they don't want anything to happen here. They don't want any changes. 
And Democrats need those public sector unions because they give them the money so they can keep winning, keep redistricting, keep the power, keep the control. This problem is right. not getting better. And unless somebody steps up and fixes it, this state is Republic, in serious, The Republican brand has to problem. define this problem. You've got to be marching through the state. David, it's not enough. You've got to go through the state. State, if you've got a one guy like State Treasurer Dan Rutherford, he should be marching through. The, he just he's just sitting back there saying, "Oh, they're doing nice things. That's fine." He doesn't want to stick his neck out. We didn't get to the folks running for governor, but they should be talking about it. Okay? I'm sure they Pat, will be. Bill Brady was here talking about. It. He's running for governor. Kirk Dillard, we hope will come on. He'll be talking about it. Okay? Bruce Rauner, he's supposed to be running for governor. We hope he'll be talking about it. Dan I hope Rutherford, so. We haven't seen Dan in, like, I can't even remember what he looks like. He's been sitting so long. But come on, Dan. Don't be afraid. Come on, on. We'll just ask you a few questions. <laughs> don't go on those shows where they ask you to talk about the vault and what's in the vault. They want to hear about pension reform. Am I being too hot for these people? I mean, really. Come on. I think they, I think they will up. all address the issue. They will. I'm going to throw out the name Anna DeVlantis. Maybe she should run. Have a woman in there. She's a smart woman. I've talked to her. She's on TV now. And I think she's a Republican. Get into the race. Let's make this lively. I think she could define the message. And I haven't talked to you about it, but, but it'd be an interesting candidate. You don't have any other females in the race. Maybe Chris Redonia. Maybe you need somebody, okay? They just said that the Republicans should be reaching out, okay? Reaching out. Where are the females in running for governor? Okay, yeah, I don't, necessarily, know, I don't know that you know, necessarily right? have to have a female running for governor to be reaching out. I mean, we have, uh, we have a, a good representation of females in the, in the yeah. legislature. Who would be, the, who would be the Republican Democratic leaders other than Chris Redonio? Anybody? The Republican leader other yeah, than Chris Redonio? Females who are in Republican leadership in the State House or State Senate other than Chris Redonio. Anybody? Oh, I, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I mean, well, you I don't, said I you don't have Republican know. leaders, so I mean, where are No, they? I say we have Republican uh, female, female uh, representatives. Well, we have female, oh, female state in, reps. In, in state yeah. reps and state senators, exactly right. But the point is you've got to get that <clears throat> brand out there. You've got to get, I mean, you've just right. articulated it for the pension thing, but it's not too clearly a Republican brand. And that's almost a Democratic brand of those 19 Democrats. I mean, what a, you got to talk about taxes. We will talk about taxes. Yeah. We will talk about taxes. And you got to talk about especially if, they, especially if they make the tax increase permanent, which they should not do. You got to talk about. You got to talk about if you and, re, and if you, you repeal the state income taxes that you say you want to do. How, what do you, how do you cut spending so that that is an achievable repeal? There are there Am are I right? there are going to be a lot of issues. As an example, right now there's a proposal out there to borrow an additional four billion dollars on top of the thirty billion that we're, that is already outstanding. So we're going to increase our bonded indebtedness by another fifteen percent uh, and push that uh, push that payment off to future generations. I mean, th there there will be a whole range of issues. I think that we can. Why are the Republican can... post possible gubernatorial candidates being so reticent? I don't think I mean, they're we, being reticent just because they don't come on your show, well, Jeff. What, what doesn't did, mean what, they're being no, reticent. No, well, what has Dillard said about pensions? You tell me. What is his position on pension reform, December 9th? Forget my show. You're, you're a colleague of his. I'm not, I'm not You're speaking. not privy to what I'm, Dillard said?